Hi everyone and welcome back to Tech Tactics Live. It's our 11th episode. It's been about four weeks since we've been together. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, instead of Tech Tactics Live, we had the PCA National Awards Ceremony and I want to congratulate all the regions and of course the volunteers on their well-deserving awards. Um, tonight we've got a full show for you. Uh, as you already know, it's Breaks 101 and we're gonna cover everything Actually, not everything because there's so much to cover, but we're going to cover some things about street cars, some things about race cars, but um, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of fun. Uh, be sure, if you haven't already, please uh, like the video, please comment, and uh, consider subscribing if you haven't already. We also have a raffle going on, so I want to thank PFC Brakes and Porsche Classic for the prizes. Make sure you put your name and where you're from, from in the uh, live chat area. I also want to thank TPC Performance, our local race shop here. They provided some of the stuff that's on the table here just uh, as a set prop. And uh, we've got a lot to cover and only an hour to cover it. So I'm going to jump right in and I'm going to introduce our two guests. And the first guest, um, I'm wearing this motorsports shirt just for him, although this is the retail motorsports shirt and not the, the factory one. Um, but he, he's, he's a, no stranger to PCA. If you've come to Tech Tactics, you've been to Porsche Motorsports. Um, he's also been in Porsche Panorama. We featured him. And so I'd just like to introduce and welcome yes, Owen Hayes, engineering hey. consultant for PFC Brakes. Hey, Owen. How are, you? How are you? I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Great to see you. To My next guest, this gentleman, I think the first time I met him, I was in the pits of a race, um, walked into a trailer because they said, you've got to meet this guy. He is just a guru when it comes to everything breaks. And he's really a strategist, but I think his official title is director of motorsports for PFC Breaks. And you'll see him at IMSA, you'll see him Indy, you know, he's, he's a walking encyclopedia of everything breaks. He comes to Tech Tactics. Um, he, he enjoys his time with us, and we enjoy our time with him because I always learn something new from him. And so my biggest thing is being able to keep this to an hour because I'll have so many questions, and I know many of you will have questions. Make sure you put your questions in the live chat. We'll get to some of them. We might not get to all of them, but we'll answer them at some point and or we we'll, might even have a second show. And the gentleman I'd like to introduce is Derek Dong. Derek, how are you, my friend? Thank you, Vu. And uh, thank you to the PCA for their advocacy for uh, PFC. Well, you, um, you've always been there for us when we have tech tactics, either east or west. Um, anytime we have anything related to, to breaks, you're there. I just want to share a quick story with breaks, my personal story about breaks, and then we'll get into the agenda here is, um, you know, I came from maybe, let's call it hot rod world and about big engines and going fast quarter mile cars back in my, my high school and college days. And uh, when I got my first Porsche, I, you know, I, it wasn't the same torque, it wasn't the same power. I mean, I bought, a, I bought an 87 3.2 liter 911 and you know it was enjoyable but i really didn't appreciate braking or the brakes that porsche has until i went to my first driver's education event i went to i believe it was a potomac region uh, driver's ed event at summit point and coming down the the straight to turn one over and over and over i was I, I became a believer of how brakes can, can win a race. And I've, I've got to imagine Owen and, and Derek are, are going to share some of those stories, but my appreciation for what Porsches have in terms of brakes and, and how they perform on the street and on the racetrack, uh, what you're gonna learn tonight is gonna be a step higher on, on the level of understanding. And we're gonna cover uh, four areas. We're gonna cover brake pads, we're gonna cover ABS, we're gonna cover PCCB, and we're gonna cover brake fluid. And I know there's a lot more in terms of brakes, but again, we have an hour, and we'll start with these four, four topics, and, and if more questions grow uh, in the chat, we'll, like I said, we'll consider a, 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 maybe a brakes 201 in the future. So let's kick it off, because this is how 
Uh, Derek usually kicks it off at Tech Tactics. Why don't we show this video that he submitted? And Derek, you can walk us through what we're watching. What, what we're watching right now is a uh, portion of this track test. And it is probably one of the toughest tests that you'll ever hear of. This dyno is spinning up Porsche uh, brake system to 160 miles an hour down to 60, pulling a 1.6D stop. Now the the uh, protocol for this particular disc track test is we have to do this 600 times without having any thermal failure of the, the disc itself. Now the first time we did this test, it took us about three or four different iterations before we figured out how to get 600 stop. And it was everything. Geometry of the disc, alloy of the disc, geometry of the brake pad, the force distribution through the caliper, and uh, the, the, in fact, the dyno that you're looking at is one of the few dynos in North America that is capable of doing full lap simulations of uh, Daytona, 24 hours of Le Mans, uh, various different tracks. And uh, uh, what's, what got us the, uh, the only North American supplier to Porsche Motorsports was this disc crack pit. And uh, within about five uh, iterations of the test, we actually ran the thing live uh, for Germany to actually view on a thermal camera and on a live camera. And they got full data streaming as to the uh, robustness of the stock. And uh, we actually uh, met the 600 stop threshold. We got a call from Porsche congratulating us on uh, our achievement. And then they asked us, how'd you do it? And uh, come to find out, none of the suppliers at the time had ever passed that test. And of course, PFC with uh, you know, us being a bunch of rednecks out of South Carolina, we didn't know any different. So that's how, uh, well, you know, basically, we didn't know we, we could do it. Wow. So let's jump right into brake pads. Um, but I know there are you use a lot of different terminology. I've seen your your uh, your presentation before. So if we can bring up the racing pad terms, maybe you can just hit a couple of high points of what you're okay, talking about. Okay. So when one of the things. Brake pads have multiple elements in them. And by today's standards, uh, we have to be very environmentally friendly nowadays. And uh, back in the early days, the brake pads were some pretty nasty components inside the friction material. But with a PFC carbon metallic brake pad, the behavior of the pad actually has to be built into the matrix of the of the formulation of the, of the pad itself. So the term bite is the initial response when you hit the brake pedal. There's cold bite, there's hot bite, but bite basically is the initial response of the of the brakes itself. Torque is the amount of longitudinal G that the brakes are actually pulling and <clears throat> we can build more or less torque into the brake pad depending on what we're trying to achieve to get the balance in the car uh, that we're looking for. Mu is, uh, is just a term for the coefficient of friction and for the most part there's some people that advertise their mu number. We do not because we believe that much of that is just marketing information. We did have a quick question, not to interrupt you, but um, people were asking about uh, 
proper bedding of, of brakes. Can you give me a quick one on that one? Uh, Fred three, what is the process to bed in new rotors and pads? And in this case, an 87 911 Carrera. Okay, so the, the, the first thing you have to, if, if it's with a PFC pad, the PFC pad actually has a, a heat treat process in our brake pads that makes it very easy to, to bed in because there's virtually no uh, low density volatiles left into the brake pad to, to bed. The key to bedding brakes is actually the cold effectiveness of the disc. Remember that most of these OE discs are manufactured in a, a process that uses a lot of cutting oil and uh, silicate uh, as part of their lubricants and while they're cutting them. And the problem with cast iron is it's absorbing all those silicate during that process. So the green effectiveness is in the disc itself. If you want to bring the disc up crudely in an effort to reduce the stress that's already in the disc and also to gas off contaminants that are in the disc after they went to form the disc itself. So on your um, outlap, it's, uh, you want to do left foot stuff. Basically, you're trying to marry the brake pad to the disc itself get a transfer layer of brake pad material to understand that most of the materials that are in a brake pad nowadays, it's not actually friction-based material, it's lubricant. And the reason why is that you don't want to have the brake pad literally micro-weld itself to the disc. So once you get this transfer layer into the disc, the, the goal is to get the disc up to about 300 C or about 450 N to try to gas off these uh, low, uh, low density volatiles in the disc and bring up the disc's temperature crudely. This reduces a lot of the stress to the disc itself. And so after you done about five laps, you bring the car in, you check your air pressures and things like that, and, and then allowing the disc to cool will help reduce much of the stress that you put in the disc itself. So for the most part, running a carbon metallic pad, you not actually have the bed pad, but you're trying to bring the disc up to the temperature food. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, Owen, why don't you help me with our first true and false for tonight? First true and false has to do with, let's see if we can get up there. Do, do, do. Majority of brake dust comes from brake pads. True or false? Let's give people a, a, a second or two to put in the answer. Majority of brake dust comes from brake pads. True or false? Owen, let's let people know. False. It's false. Correct. So, so, I, so how is that? So mostly it's coming from the actual rotor itself, up to 90% of the actual dust you're seeing. So it's actually not the, the part. And most people think that it is the part, but it's actually the, the disc itself. But then my question to you is, you know, I've... People ask this all the time, like, why does, you know, European cars, especially Porsches, have so much brake dust, uh, you know, that, that's thrown out. We can talk about that in a second, but I know there are aftermarket pads that says that they are less dusty and such. So does that mean that pad bites less, which is why it is less dusty, or how, how does that happen? How do, how do they make less dust? So, I mean, that's basically how they're mixed and the compounds that they are. So, that's basically, I mean, it doesn't mean they will have any uh, less braking performance as such, but it's basically a mixture. And they tend to be a little bit hotter for sure. And that's how they get it through their mixtures. So, mm. so one of the I, latest, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'd like to contribute a little bit to that. <clears throat> uh, 
much of the brake dust that does come off of the brakes is the iron oxides off the off of the disc itself. And it's the iron oxide that that's actually oxidizing against the clear coat of the wheels and the and the and the, the uh, paint of the car. And uh, I know Vu has some magic sauce that <laughs> helps reduce some of that uh, contaminant getting onto the car. But as far as the so-called dustless brake pads, basically much of that is it's going from a uh, a, a, uh, a high density metallic style pad to a more organic style pad where they use long fibrous uh, um, material and the, there's the same amount of dust. It's just that it's a different color and it has less uh, visualization. It does up the box thing. So would you say, um, I won't name a brand because we're not talking about particular brands, but I had um, my, my wife's Boxster was a track car for the previous owner, and they had really aggressive pads, which stopped amazing. But it was loud and lots of dust, and she, she wasn't too pleased with you know, making a scene every time she came to a stop sign. So I switched them out to a low, low dust pad, and I could definitely tell a stopping power difference. Is that always the case? Are you always going to give up one for the other? Yes. Okay. Simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. at the end of the day, in order for a race pad to have stability at elevated temperatures, it takes quite a bit of work to get the matrix of the material or the density of the material is all the way to the back. With a, uh, a road car pack, it'll actually have multiple density of materials in there to use as dampening property for noise. So that's why the road car pad starts feeling kind of spongy and bushy. You get a lot of, when you get temperature into them, because they're just not designed to have that temperature uh, stability, whereas a proper race pad has high temperature stability, has high uh, or low uh, uh, compressibility at elevated temperatures, and why the pedal feels so much better. But at the end of the day, the uh, they were not designed quite. One of, while we're talking about brake dust, uh, one of the uh, braking systems that I came across, I think it was two years ago, and it was on, um, initially on a Cayenne, and then I saw it on the new Taycan Turbo, and it's a braking, Porsche braking system that comes with white calipers, which is pretty amazing to consider having white anywhere near a set of brakes. Um, and the, the finish on these rotors were like a mirror finish. And I'm sure the car had been moved. There you go. There it is. The Porsche <laughs> surface coat of brakes. Look at the size of that brake. Look at how it's all white, that mirror finish. And it's supposedly 90% less brake dust, which is why they're able to use white paint on a caliper. How does that all work? And I believe that's still a steel rotor, right? It is an iron rotor. What they've done is they've patented a process that uh, allows silicon carbide to be sprayed into the disc finish itself. Silicon carbide is a safe uh, 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 protect of drill bits. So that's what keeps the disc from deteriorating from uh, from the abraded wear of of brake pad itself. So, so is that, it, that, it, sorry, is that surface just more durable than just going straight to the standard steel or iron? Correct. Hmm. And is the pad on that caliper formulated to work specifically with that type of surface? Yes. Hmm. 
And so, Owen, did you, did, did this technology ever end up on the racetrack or is it purely for street driven vehicles? Purely for street driven vehicles at the moment. I'm, we're, we're not particularly interested in the optics of it. We don't mind a little bit of dust. What we want is performance. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's an amazing development and that's why I, was, I gave the ratio as well. It, it is about 90% that comes from the, from the rotor. Um, so when they put that silicon carbide into the rotor, then it reduces that amount of dust being, being produced. And hence you can have white calipers. I did have the opportunity to drive a Taycan Turbo um, and got to use the brakes. And it's a, it's a fairly heavy vehicle with all the batteries and, and such in it. And it was quite amazing how well the car stopped. Um, so for, for the, un, unlike, I guess, the, the brake pads I chose for my Boxster, uh, my wife's Boxster that had less dust, but also less braking capability, it seemed like this Porsche surface coated brake system was kind of like a have your cake and eat it too for the street. So it is Owen, actually. I'm sorry, go ahead. It is actually, I mean, you think about uh, silicon carbide is also what they use for rotary cutters. So it, it, it adds to the, to the whole friction process. And obviously because it's more effective and efficient it doesn't have as much abraded wear as a standard iron disc and pad so it's a it's a very clever uh utilization of a technology that's been around for so it was five decades. i first saw it on the cayenne and then i recently saw or last last November, I guess it was, I saw it on the Taycan. So I guess maybe it'll make it into the sports cars? Would you guess, or can you say, or? <laughs> actually, we've, we've actually tested these, this material. It did a 24-hour uh, Le Mans simulation on the disc just to see how durable the thing really was. And... Um, yeah, I could see that it could get into sports cars. I mean, most of the time, you know, the sensitivity of dust is is mostly with the uh, the SUV type of vehicles, where you know you got families, and boats, and dogs, and everything else, and you know the owner just doesn't like looking at a bunch of brake dust on you know, scattered all over his car. Yeah. Whereas the sports car guy, you know, he's kind of used to it because he's driving the, the living hell out of the thing to begin with, you know. So let's go back to Owen with all out performance because, you know, Porsche Surface Code Brake, you're not worried about the wheels being dirty. In fact, you probably wear the, the brake dust on the wheels as a badge of honor of, uh, uh, when it comes to racing. So race brakes versus street brakes what's the difference is it compound materials what do we need to know there yeah i mean it's it is materials and compounds for sure the compounds are just pure racing compounds in the sense of, of what derek said earlier on is there's many layers to a, a road brake pad but normally there's only a, a, a third of uniform compound mix on a race brake pad and as derek said also earlier is the idea is to get that up to a temperature that gives you consistent properties because the driver needs that feedback and that consistency to be able to attack a lap in a consistent manner to put in a really um, stable lap time stint and it's all about pushing the car to the limit and keeping the car that way. So if the race, if the racing brake pad or brake system uh, alters its performance, that's the last thing that that, that driver needs. So does the environment of the racetrack, um, I guess, dictate different types of race pads or race components? Like if it's going to be cold and rainy versus hot and dry? Yeah, well, there's a very open question. There's many, many things that, that we do. I mean, nowadays we have, the cars are now homologated, which means you have to give the our uh, details up to the organizing body and say, this is what we're going to drive. So you're basically stuck with the same type of rotors through the whole year. 
However, we replace those on a regular basis. But the brake pads are completely free for the amount of the compound that you choose. So that is something that we use to tune the car and quite effectively. And we not only have different compounds, but we also have a different type of pad in the sense of that we have sprint brake pads and also endurance brake pads. So we we can, we're now actually, it's quite amazing. I mean, it's, uh, we're now approaching nearly being able to get through the Daytona 24 hours of one set of parts and that, that 10 years ago, a decade ago, it's unthinkable. So there's a lot of progress in that area as well. We have a question from Stephen Williams. Um, in his opinion, he, he says, since cross drill rotors seem to crack so often, why does Porsche still use them on cars versus using slotted rotors? I've never, I mean, I've seen little cracks, but not cracks to failure on my own personal cars with cross drill rotors. So what do you, what do you guys have to say about that question? Well, first off, when back in the day when drill discs became popular, the friction materials that we were using back in those days were uh, based off of an asbestos uh, uh, matrix. And asbestos has a nasty habit of gassing off. So the drill disc was developed in order to get rid of some of the, the boundary layer that the gassing off of the uh, of the brake friction materials back in the day. So when Porsche started running drill discs, it soon became part of the brand. And if you ever look at a Porsche drill disc, you'll see that it has a very unique pattern to the drill uh, shape in that none of the none of the holes are actually lined up with each other which is a very unique uh, layout. And then uh, when, when, when drill discs were very popular in racing, the shape of the hole, chamfer of the hole, and how Porsche would, would work hard in the hole would actually reduce the cracking as opposed to um, creating more stress rise like today's uh, uh, OE and aftermarket discs do. First off, a, a drill disc will never run cooler than a slotted disc or plain disc. I know there's a lot of crazy claims out there of what drill discs will do for you, but most, for the most part, it's part of the Porsche brand and it's still part of the Porsche brand. The thing that's kind of unique about it is that Porsche actually has cast the manufacturer cast the hole into their disc instead of machining them. Wow, good to know. I mean, I, I know growing up seeing cross drilled rotors on the car meant it was a serious sports car. <laughs> um, I, quickly, I just wanted to announce our raffle winners. Uh, the first raffle winner is Paul Gentili. Um, the second one is our folks at uh, BBI Autosport. Congratulations to you guys. And our third place winner is Randy Cole. And so um, I think it, it goes as such. Paul Gentili gets a Motive Bleeder. The second place gets the Classic Bag. And the third place will get the um, Racing Brake Fluid. So. Guys, congratulations. Make sure you send a quick email or chat with Damon on the live chat so that we can send out your swag. Before we get to ABS, and we'll keep things moving along, but since we're talking about uh, race brakes, let's do a race brakes, true or false. Race brakes are designed for a higher temperature capacity. Race brakes are designed for higher temperature capacity. The answer is true. And then let's go over to our um, true and false number three, and then we'll jump into ABS. Brakes stop the car, true or false? Put your answer in, brakes stop 
the car true or false? And the answer? False. Derek, what stops a car if a brake doesn't stop a car? It's the tire that stops the car. You're right. You do a hell of a job stopping the wheel. But if you're shaking hands with Jesus going into turn one and the tire's up off the ground, <laughs> you're going to still hiss that wall pretty hard. And this is why we love Derek, so he tells it like it is. <laughs> and that's why it's so important. We're not talking about tires 101 today, but that's why it's so important to choose, especially Owen, I'm sure at the racetrack, you know, the, the right tire, the, the right compound is so important is even though you might be able to strategize for your brakes to bring the vehicle to a stop, if you don't have the strategy on tire management, it doesn't really matter because you didn't, you weren't able to, to bring the car down. So yeah, um, you got no, yeah, you got no idea how much that's <laughs> so true. I mean, you can have the best brakes in the world, you can have the best car in the world, you can have the best everything on the car, but if you don't have good tires in the car, you're nowhere. And as the, the, said, four, the the four contact patches are so important, right? So that's critical. Cool. And just as a as a as a side note. The amount of work that goes into a race weekend of just controlling those four contact patches is huge, just because that's all you're really thinking about. And just uh, everything on the car, especially the brakes, have such an influence on what happens with that. So it's something that we think about an awful lot. Yeah. It's one of all the right, reasons so... why PFC is at so many different race venues, is because we, we were there to understand. Uh, what the tire, what the car, what the track uh, is giving us in terms of a grip model so that we can understand best how to help balance the car for better performance. And it's, uh, it's actually pretty daunting because uh, there's so many different uh, platforms of vehicles out there. And trying to get your head around all the different platforms and 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 understand uh, where the benefits are going to be with what decisions you help with your race engineer or what have you, you know, makes makes it a makes it a pretty challenging job. So let's move on to what used to be an option um, that was only available on nicer cars. I think we take advantage of the fact that most cars now have an ABS system in it, right? And, um, you know, I, I remember when uh, in the, I think it was mid 80s when my, my parents were looking at BMWs and Mercedes and ABS systems and, and such were so, um, you know, so, so leading edge. Um, and, you know, maybe we, we talk about it quite a bit at Tech Tactics, but let's delve into the ABS system a bit with Derek and talk about you know, what it really does, talk about what it means uh, in the racing world and, and um, maybe maintenance or, or whatever you might want to share about ABS. Well, with ABS systems, there are a, a, a number of different uh, modes. There's the preemptive mode, and then there's the reactive mode. Now, with today's modern vehicles, the preemptive mode is part of the traction control, part of the stability control, part of the torque vectoring, and uh, as well as uh, uh, the reactive mode, where it's just looking at wheel slip itself. And one of the things that your audience needs to understand is that with a uh, standard uh, OE style master cylinder and booster, there's this term called jump in. And jump in is the, the boosted assist to the master cylinder. And if you look at the top of the booster can, typically there's a TRW sticker that's got a uh, 
anything from 3.14 to 5.5 number on the booster dam. The bigger the number, the bigger the jump is, the easier it is to lock. The smaller the number, the firmer the brake pedal, the more feel you have for the lock, which is why a GT3 RS, for instance, have a 3.4 um, booster in their car. And uh, like the a Boxster will have as high as a 5.5 uh, jump in with their boost. So the key to understanding preemptive mode is that the ABS is always looking at longitudinal G over speed over time uh, versus the program prep model within it. So it'll actually pull pressures out of the system as a preemptive mode to protect the tire. And you can actually feel in, in, in your seat. When you first initially apply the brake pedal, you can feel the car tend to sit down under braking because it's utilizing both the front and the rear uh, grip equally at that point. But at about the second half of the stop, it starts pulling rear pressure out to get the stability into the car. And that's when the nose of the car heaves over to the, to the front and you feel it instead of in your butt, you feel it in your, in your shoulder blades because of the weight transfer. So this automatically adds understeer to the car. So it's understanding what the APS preemptive mode is actually doing uh, to the car yeah. to help gain an appreciation of how to take the most advantage of it. Once it goes in preemptive mode, then it starts looking at wheel slip, which is the reactive mode of the ABS. So once the tire starts to slip, it'll start pulling pressure out each one of the quarters that are actually beginning to pop. And of course, to do that, think about it. If 90% of the tire is being consumed by the stop, you only have 10% of the tire yet to allow the car to or accelerate. So <clears throat> ABS is a, a wonderful tool, but it can confuse a lot of track day people because it's not always intuitive. Mm. A non-ABS car is intuitive. You, you can feel and, and modulate where the weight transfer is dancing in the car. Whereas an ABS car, is keeping it at that threshold grip all the time. So, Owen, would you say it's true that an ABS-equipped car takes a mere mortal driver to a higher level than if that same person were to drive a non-ABS car, and then if you are a super driver, that maybe the ABS can be a hindrance because it's not doing exactly like what that super driver wants it to do? No, I think the way that, so the motors, motorsport tends to, or we have a slightly different mapping in the ABS, so it, it's not, doesn't really react as I would say slow as a road car ABS. Um, so now, you know, it is more challenging to drive a car that is without ABS, let's say. Um, but the ABS systems have become so advanced now that, you know, I think it's really helped drivers in general. But the super driver, to be honest, he's still um, 
confronted with that issue of trying to push the brakes to the you know to the absolute limit as well and get that feedback on the last bit of braking before opening and releasing and then going into the corner. So it's still that the super driver will need that talent, let's say, or that 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 uh, feedback that he has just naturally. And then the middle driver can certainly help him, but the the car without the ABS that's a challenge for everybody. And it's uh, again it's the, the natural talented guy uh, separates himself from the average guy. So yeah. it, it's I think ABS really it's more about having a you know a, a, a belt and brace thing. You know you have ABS, so you tend to be a little bit braver as well. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be any better off. You're still going to be driving the car properly and braking properly. But it gives you that a lot more confidence. So how different is let's say the GT series, um, you know GT4, GT3 series street cars, um, their ABS systems compared to? you know, uh, the club sport cars. Is there a difference in tunability? Um... Maybe just the mappings, the way that it reacts, just the speed of reaction. Um, I mean, it's the components of the ABS are, are basically the same. It's just mostly the soft stuff and the, the vacuum that is slightly different. Uh, mainly it's the same. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's go on. We're at uh, 8.43, so we still have two more topics we're going to go through here, but they should be pretty quick. Um, the next one, let's do true and false number four. True and false number four. PCCB rotors are brittle like a porcelain plate. PCCB rotors are brittle like a porcelain plate. Put your answers in the chat, please. And the answer is true. They are brittle, but you really have to, we, we, we'll, we'll answer this and, and, and <coughs> expand on it. And, and Derek, you'll, you'll expand on it. Um, you know, PCCBs is like the best option for a, a, a Porsche braking system, right? We talked a little bit earlier about steel brakes. And then we talked about Porsche sur surface coated brakes, which is kind of the mid-range. And then the Porsche ceramic composite brakes, the PCCBs, are the, the, the top level um, that, that Porsche offers. So it's, we say it's brittle, but for what it's doing and the advantages of PCCB, maybe, Derek, you want to kind of get into why it's the top choice. Well... I don't know that I would call it a, a top choice, but it is a, a very advanced material in that how durable it is. Now, it actually starts off as a powdered uh, carbon and resin, and it's molded. And uh, it gained its shape and... Uh, <clears throat> In its form, form <coughs> excuse me. But you can see in this particular uh, illustration that the PCCB is 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 basically a uh, a molded structure, and that it's heated to you know about 500 C to form this thing, and when. When we say it's kind of akin to a porcelain plate, basically the ceramicized uh, process is what makes it so durable. Now, the problem that PCCBs have is that uh, they don't usually show a braided wear like an iron disc does. What happens is that as these things start to wear, they lose mass. And around the circumference of the hat, you'll see that there's various different uh, markings that, that tell the mechanic that what the uh, gram weight is in that particular quadrant of the disc itself. And so they have this ultrasonic tool 
measures the density of the disk and calculates how much mass is actually being lost for oxidation because it doesn't show the abraded. So when and you're when you're looking at or observing whether or not your PCC brakes are worn out, in the traditional fashion, you look for like that lip around the edge of an iron rotor, but you won't have that with a PCCB, right? So that's why, as I learned from you at Tech Tactics, you need to weigh it to see if it's worn. Exactly. And, yeah. and uh, the other thing too is, unlike an iron disc or a carbon-carbon disc, a PCCB disc literally reflects the energy. It doesn't absorb it, which means that the heat exchanger in this whole packet is actually the brake pad and the caliper, which is why the brake pad looks like a roofing shingle because it's so huge. Yeah. Because it's part of it, it, it is the heat exchanger in the system. And it's also the reason why these bright yellow calipers turn to a burnt orange color during track day event uh, with, the, with the temperature that the PCCBs. Now you can see in this particular photo, notice the spider web abrasing on the yeah. biscuits. That spider web crazy an indication of just how hot the thing's getting to. And those are basically tension uh, marks on the disc itself. And uh, it's part of that oxidation process to let you know that the, uh, the disc is in fact deteriorating. And, that, and that's normal wear? That's nothing to be concerned about in that particular photo? Well, it, it's normal for a PCCB disc, yes. Yeah. So we've um, we've been to Tech Tactics where they've had a regular iron rotor and a PCC rotor, and you one is a featherweight compared to an iron rotor. How much of an advantage is that for a street-driven car, or even for if you're taking your car in a DE? Well, that that's a great question. Um, when it comes to lap time. You know, typically, the engineers are always looking to reduce weight, particularly on the sprung portion of the car. But if you get better consistency in your braking with an iron brake, typically the lap times don't show a whole lot of difference between the two. But the uh, from the acceleration standpoint, you know, anytime you can knock weight out of the unsprung area, it's going to be an advantage. All right, let's see. Let's go to our last one. We've got about 10 more minutes. Our next true and false. Brake fluid tastes like Guinness beer. <laughs> true or false? I think, I think this was submitted by Owen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We we do not encourage you to taste brake fluid. Do not do that. This was a joke, obviously. It yeah. is false, but the you know if if you started with clear brake fluid and you go to change your brake brake fluid and it looks dark as a Guinness, then it is bad. That's why Guinness came on our mind. But um, this last <laughs> section, we're going to talk a little bit about brake fluid. 101, that's why we have these bleeders here. Um, educate me. What do I need to know other than you need clean brake fluid and you should probably change it at least how many miles annually, two years, depending on usage. What do I need to know? Well, first off, brake fluid is, 90% of the brake fluid is made from glycol, which by its, uh, by its, uh, uh, matrix glycol is a hygroscopic material. So the moment you crack open a, a bottle of brake fluid, it's absorbing water. And it's the water that gasses off when you have brake fade 
or fluid boil in a system. So actually one of the cheapest uh, performance additive that you can put to your car is to put in proper uh, racing style brake fluid itself. Now the, the other thing about brake fluid is you want to understand its viscous quality. The thinner the viscous quality, the easier it gets through the ABS shuttle valves, the more responsive the brake system becomes. And Porsche Motorsports did a, a very extensive test on brake fluid against multiple different brands. And our PFC 665 is now OE on all Porsche GT3 Cup cars and all Porsche Cayman GT4 Club Sport and uh, Monti spec cars. So it's OE with uh, with Porsche Motorsport. And uh, we, we yeah, uh, packaged it in a 500 milliliter bottle. As we said before, the moment you crack open the, the bottle, it's trying to absorb water. Hey, and, Derek, just one of, our, one of our viewers, I believe, had a question. Uh, you mentioned as soon as you crack open the, the brake fluid, it absorbs water. So let's say you do crack it open and you use two thirds of the brake fluid, you get put the cap back on the, the, the bottle, can you keep it on the shelf for later usage or should you toss it? Because you just said it starts absorbing water as soon as you crack it open. Well, it depends on what you're gonna use the brake fluid for. <coughs> if you're gonna do track day events, you should always run fresh brake fluid. In. So a new can each time. Yeah, because uh, for every for every one percent water contamination that the brake fluid goes through, it'll drop its dry boiling point by a hundred degrees F. So as little as three percent water contamination would render the brake fluid not much more practical than a than a, a bottle of water. Mm. So we're we're in the south, right? I mean, and it's humid out here. Right. If you're in Arizona, you know, desert, uh, it could probably keep for quite some time because there's very little humidity on it. But the uh, where it's humid, you know, that's the easiest, cheapest thing to ensure a, uh, a, a robust, firm brake pedal is to have proper fresh fluid in. Yeah, and you, you don't do it every month or even every six months. So I know it's tough sometimes throwing away that, that much that might be left in the container, but the next time you do it, for me, I just start with a fresh can just so that I know that I'm starting with the best stuff. We have a quick question from Luke G here. It says, uh, can we use low viscosity brake fluid on older Porsches like a 944 968 or 928. Absolutely. Okay. And when he says, I mean, just because I don't understand, low, seals, when, low viscosity. Seals, what is a low viscosity brake fluid? Well, it, you'll notice that there are some brake fluids when you pour it out of the can, it looks like engine oil. Uh huh. And, you know, that's a high viscous quality fluid. Yeah. And when, when you pour PFC fluid out, it, it almost looks like water because of this oh. okay. quality to it. And you want to have the thinner stuff in it because typically it has less compressibility issues than the stuff that has a higher risk. I see. Most people don't realize, I mean, everybody says fluids are non-compressible. That's not true. You know, it depends on the matrix of the material. Certainly com uh, have compressibility issues with various different fluid. 
So uh, whenever possible, particularly if you have a track day car, you want to keep the low viscous quality in your brake fluid. Okay. So we are almost to the top of the hour. I still had a question. I know my older cars have dot three, I think, and newer cars are dot four, dot five. Like, how does that all work? I mean, I just know if it says whatever it says, put the same in it, but can you put four into three or, I don't know. I, that, I just stick with whatever it says on the, on the top of the, the <laughs> reservoir. But, but for those that are wondering, can you mix and match, or should you even mix and match? Dot three, dot four, are all glycol-based brake fluids, and it's when the dot rating is actually more of a shelf life value. Oh. So the higher the dot number, the less glycol, the more ester it has in the brake fluid. And it's the ester that adds that viscous quality to it. Now, uh, dot five is pure ester. Okay. Which is, uh, it's fine for vintage cars and, or something that you're going to store. But you don't want to race on that stuff because it gives you a really lousy pedal. Mm, I gotcha. So you can't mix dot five with anything with three and four, but you can certainly uh, use, uh, of course, we always recommend that you exchange all the fluid that's in the system so that uh, you have uh, similar behavior to the, to the fluid that you're, you're putting into the system. So whatever you're putting in, just make sure it's consistent fluid throughout the whole system. All right, one more question that I had, and I promise I'll let you go. So for my 87, 911, when I do the brakes, it's very straightforward because there's no ABS. Flush, the, flush, uh, flush the, the fluids, no problem. The Boxster has ABS. I still flush it the regular way, but is there, do I need to do something with the ABS to properly flush it or... I've I've always told you you're supposed to cycle the ABS or something, but I don't have a tool to cycle. So by me doing it the manual way on a car that has ABS, is that a bad thing or is that still good? Or uh, that's a great question. Um, the Porsche technicians, you know, do have a software that cycles the ABS, turns the pumps on, and on a modern uh, ABS system. There's typically an accumulator in the system, and it's a bitch to get the bubbles out of the accumulator. Uh. So that's why if you're going to do it properly, you should actually have Porsche technician cycle the pump so that it can burp the bubbles out of the uh, accumulator. Mm. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more research on that. Well, gentlemen, we are at the top of the hour. I told you the hour would go by very quickly. I thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, for those of you watching, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you on the next episode of Tech Tactics Live. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Derek. Thank you.